Yeah, well, I'm not the only person that could do this, and I see, I think Ellen was here and Corinne is here, so there's a lot of us uh, in the Northeast working on soil health. I'm not sure if we're doing anything that's really different than anybody else. You know, I feel like we're all trying to accomplish the same thing, meet the same goals, you know, that Barry was talking about. Um, and, you know, I think, we know that we need to do this. You know, we've known this for a long time, actually. And if you look back in the historical records, the historical research, it's actually like a little bit depressing, you know, to see the 1925 or the 18 whatever paper saying things like, you know, we need to, we need to use green manures to promote the health of our crops. You know, the, the same messages have been there for a really long time. And I don't know why we're still up here trying to make it happen. <laughs> but we have to. We know that it's a critical, critical time. And so, well, I decided that I would talk about instead of telling you about the no-till we're trying to do and the, this that we're trying to do, that I was going to tell you a bit about my experiences working in Vermont with Vermont farmers trying to make these changes. And this is Earl. He said I could use his photo up here and he is a grumpy man. And he knows that and he actually wanted to, you can't, oh, I'm sorry. How about I just hold that? Maybe that would be. No? I am a loud person in general. What do you want me to do? <laughs> right here? All right. I got that from my mom. She's loud too. We don't even have a lot of people in our household, but I feel like we're always yelling. It's a weird thing. But um, so this is Earl, and he actually, he laughed when I told him I was going to use him as, as an example. But, you know, so part of this process, and, and Barry alluded to it, is, you know, we know about soil health. Uh, Julia Gaskins was with me, and, and she said, yeah, I, 20 years ago, I was trying to do this same thing. You know, I can remember when I first started my job in extension, I had those little soil health kits that NRCS put together. and. You know, I remember the first talk I gave an extension about soil health, my very first presentation, thinking the farmers would be as in awe about soil as I was when I first heard it, was like deer in headlights 15, 20 years ago. So here we are again, trying to do the same things. What's different? There is a lot of momentum right now, not just from us, Okay, but in the farming community too. It's a really exciting time. But I think we really have to understand, and I don't have the answers to this, right? I'm just a person too. But why don't we change? How many times have you said the same thing to your children? Why don't they listen? <laughs> you know, if we could figure all this out, we wouldn't be standing there, uh, and maybe we wouldn't have jobs. But when, <laughs> when I, Ugh, I hadn't thought about that. Um, so why isn't it that we don't change? And I remember talking to farmers about cover cropping. You know, farming's already risky enough, right? Why try something new? If what I already do works just fine, year in and year out, I've been growing continuous corn. John Roy, a farmer uh, in South Hero, Vermont, I've been growing continuous corn here for 40 years. I always harvest corn off of that field. Why would I do anything different? Well, that's, a, that's it's true, right? And we live that way every day in our lives. Why would I wear different shoes today? Why would I go spend $100 on a new pair of shoes when these are just fine, okay? So we have to ask ourselves those questions. I feel like we've got a lot of research to do, for sure. But we have a lot of practices in hand that we've done a lot of research on that we still can't get people to adopt. What's the problem, okay? There's a darn human element involved in this process. That's the problem, <laughs> which is true, 
okay? And it's not just the farmers, you know, I'm one of those too, my husband's one of those, okay? It's us. How many extension people are here, you know, 20 years ago, you thought all this was baloney, okay? Remember, if you think it won't work, it won't work, correct? So one of the things I've noticed is what happens when what we've always done just isn't working so well anymore. And this is what's happening in a lot of places, right? Crop losses year after year, crop insurance, somebody said seven inch rains, maybe not seven, 10 inch, whatever. Things just kind of aren't like they used to be. It's not as easy to uh, grow that corn on the same field year after year with moldboard plow and so on and so forth. So usually for several years, we'll keep doing what we used to do, but then all of a sudden, you start looking for a different way, right? Every day I drive to work the same way. I drove to high school that same way. I have driven on the same road to get off of the island that I live on, it's actually a peninsula, but only connected to Canada, so if you wanna go anyway. So, every day. And this year, for the first time, that road was closed because of a flood. What I used to do didn't work anymore. I had to find another way, okay? And that's what I see happening for a lot of people. It's not where we wanna be, but, you know, that's where we're at. And, you know, you can see the Northeast there, and actually parts of Vermont, they've actually um, shown parts of Vermont near where I live, nine inches more of precipitation a year in, in the main growing season. That becomes a lot more difficult to deal with, okay? It means things have to change. We can't just keep doing the same things the way we did them, because it's just not working anymore. So why do we change? Who here is an extension person? Who knows an Earl? Everybody knows an Earl. Okay, the first time I ever went to Earl's farm, I, <laughs> I was scared to death. He definitely didn't make me feel comfortable, and I think he sat here like this the whole time I was talking. Wait, that stopped the, I'll just walk like that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so relationships. Now, you know, Earl brings me a Christmas card, okay? Building relationships is so important to this process. You know, how many times do you see, you know, certain agencies hire all these new people to come in and do something and nobody wants to do it? Okay, it takes time. It takes building the relationship. Okay, it's an important part of this process. A different perspective. If you said to Ron Roseman, the government's coming to your farm tomorrow to take two tons of sop topsoil and they're not gonna pay you anything for it, what would you say? What would you do? Nothing. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But, <laughs> you know, a different perspective. But yet we let Mother Nature come and strip the topsoil off of our farms, and many of us do nothing about it. A different perspective. Pretty sure if you told any farmer the government was coming to get something from them for free, action. We would take action <laughs> and make sure that they didn't get it, okay? A different perspective helps make change. And then, encouragement, like myself. And when I, when I first started my job, this is one of the first fields I saw cover cropped in Vermont. And I had a handout. And <laughs> I went by Wayne Fisk. Sure enough, he had written in pen with a little circle, crop pest, next to me. <laughs> And I, I was kind of proud of that. But, you know, that extra encouragement, 
to keep trying, to help get the momentum going, keep it going, you know, in information, technical assistance, sharing what other people are doing, you know, that's what I do. I don't do anything special, really. Shouldn't say that. But, you know, just being there, being encouraging, because I think it will work. It will. And sharing that enthusiasm and the information, okay, is all a really important part of the process. Now, the other part that I've seen, and I'll probably get sued by Time Magazine because I made that myself, but <laughs> is peer pressure, <laughs> right? Somebody else already said that, you know? But who would have ever thought that a simple radish could have created the stories, the competitions, you know, how big was the radish you had this year? My radish was this big, it was this big, and they, you know, farmers are bringing them to meetings. You're reading about cover crops in the New York Times, in the John Deere furrow, soil health. It's everywhere if you're not doing it. Right? So, soil health has made its way into the popular press. Farmers are reading about it every day. They're going to bed at night, dreaming about tillages, radishes. Who would have ever thought that that would happen? But it's part of the process, right? We know the tools that we have. We have work to do on them. But a big part of the process is the human element and the process that we have to put into place, okay? When you're working with real people, <laughs> don't forget, you gotta meet people where they're at. We can't expect that every single farm that we work with is gonna put a complex system into place the first day we walk on that farm. You gotta meet people where they're at. I bugged this farmer so much one time to cover crop, he said, if you leave me alone, I'll do it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Simple enough. But you got to meet people where they're at. Okay? You got to start somewhere. You got to take baby steps. And we all have to celebrate when we do that. Right? I'm almost out of time. I didn't even get to what I was going to really talk about. I, I used to do this more often, but... You know, I live in a, in a cold place, a lot of you do. I'm up there in that corner in case you didn't know where Vermont was. Um, it is a state in, in New England, which is a region. But, you know, we live in a cold place. Uh, it's cold and it's also very wet, as I already talked about. So, you know, we have some challenges. We all have challenges. I don't care where you live, you have something that somebody has said to you, maybe perceived, and it may be real. Irregardless, you have to start to overcome those barriers and challenges, the perceived ones and the real ones, in order for this to happen. Okay? You can tell somebody that you're out of your mind. It is not true that cover crops keep the ground cooler and wetter in the spring. But until you show them, okay, it doesn't matter if it's perceived or real. They all have to be overcome in order for us to make progress. And that's what we're dealing with. We don't have crop rotations. I put this up here because I wish we did. <laughs> okay? We grow two crops, really, in Vermont. We grow hay and we grow corn silage. And if those intermingle, it's a lucky farm. Okay? We also grow rocks, which is why if you have a field that's in corn and there's no rocks, that's why it's in corn for 40 years. Okay, has anybody here ever picked rocks as a young child? Now they make rock crushers. Anybody heard of those? Rock breaks and things like that, because kids apparently don't do these things anymore. Okay, so we're dealing with this. We're dealing with slope land. Okay, so we're creating new crop rotations with cover crops, right? The baby steps. We put a cover crop in a system, it becomes more diverse. You get these benefits. Okay? I can't start talking to the farmers about growing turnips and, you know, wheat and, you know, that's just not going to fly. 
but if I can convince them to put a cover crop in with that corn, I feel like I've really accomplished something, and I have. Okay, we see increased yields with cover crops. Once I showed farmers, started talking to farmers, Corinne too, lots of people here, that a cover crop could be feed for your dairy cattle. It didn't become just something they felt they had to do for the government or for their neighbors. It's a crop now, okay? And it becomes part of a system, it becomes part of what they do to make it work, to get the benefits. It doesn't just become the thing that they feel like they should be doing, which is very different, okay? I know I'm out of time, and I'm just gonna end on that note. You want me to end, I'm ending. I don't want to end, I could go on forever. But I just want to thank NRCS for helping us accomplish some of the work that we've accomplished, um, and also Sarah.